Yosemite Valley and Flood, written in 1872 by John Weir. Many a joyful stream is born in the Sierras, but none can sing like the Merced. In childhood, high on the mountains, her silver thread is a moving melody. Of sublime Yosemite, she is the voice. The booming chaparral, or the flowery plains, owe to her fullness their plant wealth of purple and gold, and to the loose dipping willows and broad green oaks she is bounteous in blessing. I think she is the most absorbing and readable of rivers. I have lived with her for three years, sharing all her life and fortunes, dreaming that I appreciated her. But I have never so much as imagined the sublimity, the majesty of her music, until seeing and listening at every pore I stood in her temple today. December brought to Yosemite, first of all, a cluster of ripe golden days and silvery nights, a radiant company of the sweetest winter children of the sun. The blue sky had Sabbath and slept in its high dome, and down in its many mansions of cannon and cave, crystals grew in the calm nights and fringed the rocks like mosses. The November torrents were soothed, and settled tranquility beamed from every feature of rock and sky. In the afternoon of December 16, 1871, an immense crimson cloud grew up in solitary grandeur above cathedral rocks. It resembled a fungus with a bulging base like a sequoia, a smooth tapering stalk, and a round, bossy, down-curled head like a mushroom, stalk, head, and root, in equal, glowing, half-transparent crimson, one of the most gorgeous and symmetrical clouds I have ever beheld. Next morning, I looked eagerly at the weather, but all seemed tranquil, and whatever was being done in the deep places of the sky, little stir was visible below. An ill-defined dimness consumed the best of the sunbeams, and toward noon well-developed grayish clouds appeared, having a close, curly grain like a bird's-eye maple. Late in the night, some rain fell, which changed to snow, and in the morning, about ten inches remained unmelted on the meadows, and was still falling, a fine, cordial snowstorm. But the end was not yet. On the night of the 18th, rain fell in torrents, but, as it had a temperature of 34 degrees Fahrenheit, the snow line was only a few feet above the meadows, and there was no promise of flood. Yet sometime after 11 o'clock, the temperature was suddenly raised by a south wind to 42 degrees, carrying the snow line to the top of the wall and far beyond, out on the upper basins perhaps, to the very summit of the range, and morning saw Yosemite in the glory of flood. Torrents of warm rain were washing the valley walls and melting the upper snows of the surrounding mountains, and the liberated waters held to jubilee. On both sides, the sentinel foamed a splendid cascade, and across the valley, by the three brothers, down through the pine grove, I could see fragments of an unaccountable outgush of snowy cascades. I ran for the open meadow, that I might hear and see the whole glowing circumference at once. But the tinkling brook was an unfordable torrent, bearing down snow and boulders like a giant. Further up the debris, I discovered a place where the stream was broken up into three or four strips among the boulders, where I crossed easily and ran for the meadows. But on emerging from the bordering bushes, I found them filled with green lakes, edged and island with floating snow. I had to keep along the debris as far as Hutchings, where I crossed the river and reached a wadeable meadow in the midst of the most glorious congregation of waterfalls ever laid bare to mortal eyes. Between Blacks and Hutchings, there were ten snowy, majestic, loud-voiced cascades and falls. In the neighborhood of Glacier Point, six. From Three Brothers to Yosemite Falls, nine. Between Yosemite and Arch Falls, ten. Between Washington Column and Mount Watkins, ten. 
on the slopes of South Dome, facing Mirror Lake, 8. On the shoulder of the South Dome, facing the main valley, 3. 56 newborn falls occupying this upper end of the valley, besides a countless host of silvery netted arteries gleaming everywhere. I did not go down to the Ribbon or Pohono, but the whole valley there must have been upward of a hundred. As if inspired with some great water purpose, cascades and falls had come thronging, in Yosemite costume, from every grove and canyon of the mountains, and be it remembered that these falls and cascades were not small, dainty, momentary gushes, but broad, noble-mannered water creations, sublime in all their attributes, and well-worthy Yosemite rocks, shooting an arrowy foam from a height of near 3,000 feet, the smallest of which could be heard several miles away. A perfect storm of waterfalls throbbing out their lives in one stupendous song. I have criticized Hill's painting for having two large rocks between Sentinel and Cathedral Rocks. Now, I would not be unbelieving against 50. From my first standpoint on the meadow towards Lamons, only one fall is usually seen. Now, there are 40. A most glorious convention, this of vocal waters, not remote and dim, as only half present, but with forms and voices wholly seen and felt, each throbbing out rays of beauty warm and palpable as those of the sun. All who have seen Yosemite in summer will remember the comet forms of Upper Yosemite Falls and the laces of Nevada. In these waters of the Jubilee, the lace tissue predominates, but there is also a plentiful mingling of arrowy comets. A cascade back of blacks is composed of two white shafts set against the dark wall about 30 feet apart and filled in with chained and beaded gauze of splendid pattern among the living meshes of which the dark purple granite is dimly seen. A little above Glacier Point, there is a half-woven, half-divided web of cascades, with warp and woof so similar in song and in gestures that they appear as one existence, living and rejoicing by the pulsings of one heart. The row of cascades between Washington Column and the Arch Falls are so closely side by side that they form an almost continuous sheet, and those about Indian Cannon and the Brothers are not a whit less noble. Tisiac is crowned with surpassing glory. Her sculpted walls and bosses and her great dome are nobly adorned with clouds and waters, and her thirteen cascades give her voice of song. The Upper Yosemite is queen of all these mountain waters. Nevertheless, in the first half-day of Jubilee, her voice was scarce heard. Ever since the coming of the first November storms, Yosemite has flowed with a constant stream, although far from being equal to the high water in May and June. About three o'clock this afternoon, I heard a sudden crash and booming mixed with heavy gaspings and rocky, angular explosions, and I ran out, sure that a rock avalanche had started near the top of the wall and hoping to see some of the huge blocks journeying down. But I quickly discovered that these craggy, sharp-angled notes belonged to the flood wave of the upper fall. The great wave, gathered from many a glacier cannon of the Hoffman Spurs, had just arrived, sweeping logs and ice before it, and, plunging over the tremendous verge, was blended with the storm notes of crowning grandeur. During the whole two days of storm, no idle, unconscious water appeared, and the clouds and winds and rocks were inspired with corresponding activity and life. Clouds rose hastily, upon some errand, to the very summit of the walls, with a single effort, and, as suddenly, returned, or, sweeping horizontally near the ground, draggled long-bent streamers through the pine tops while others traveled up and down Indian Cannon and overtopped the highest brows, then suddenly drooped and condensed, or, thinning to a gauze, veiled half the valley, 
leaving here and there a summit looming alone. These clouds and the crooked cascades raise the valley rocks to double their usual height for the eye, mounting from cloud to cloud, and from angle to angle upon the cascades, obtained a truer measure of their sublime stature. The warm wind still poured in from the south, melting the snows far out on the highest mountains. Thermometer at noon, 45 degrees. The smaller streams of the valley edge are waning by the slackening of the rain, but the far-reaching streams coming in by the Tenaya, Nevada, and Illouette canyons are still increasing. The Merced, in some places, overflows its banks, having risen at once from a shallow, prattling, ill-proportioned stream to a deep, majestic river. The upper Yosemite is in full, gushing, throbbing glory of prime. Still louder spring its shafts of song. Still deeper grows the intense whiteness of its mingled meteors. Fearlessly blow the winds among its dark, shadowy chambers, now softly bearing away the outside sprays, now swaying and bending the whole massive column. So sings Yosemite, with her hundred fellow falls, to the trembling bushes and solemn waving pines and winds and clouds and living, pulsing rocks, one stupendous unit of mountain power, one harmonious storm of mountain love. On the third day, the storm ceased, frost killed the new falls, the clouds are withered and empty, a score of light is drawn across the sky, and our chapter of flood is finished. Visions like these do not remain with us as mere maps and pictures, flat shadows cast upon our minds, to brighten at times when touched by association or will, and fade again from our view, like landscapes in the gloaming. They saturate every fiber of the body and soul, dwelling in us and with us like holy spirits through all of our after-deaths and after-lives. Thanks for listening.